fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, we're back now. And joining us, as we said earlier, is uh, Peter Sacco. Um, and how are you doing today, Peter? I'm doing exceptional. Al. Thanks so much for having me on your show and everybody listening. Hope yeah. you're having an awesome, awesome day. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, now, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, all sorts of stuff, but let's before we get into the uh, Niagara Most Haunted and and what you do and everything, um, tell us about you a little bit. <laughs> well, it depends if you want the fun, Pete, or the um, the mundane. Um, you know, with that said. Actually, with Niagara's Most Haunted, it, it, that turned out to be more of a hobby project, which actually, ironically, has gone beyond hobby in, in many regards in terms of getting a lot of um, requests to do stuff and the popularity of it. But with that said, my background is generally I am a university slash college professor professor <laughs> in psychology, and that's what I've uh, been doing for the last 18 years. Um, I specialize in addiction studies. I specialize in criminal psychology, where I used to work and do profiling in the past for police and work with them and train them. And I also do uh, stuff in relationship. Um, and with that said, I for a sidebar, I used to write quite a bit. And as it turned out, I guess my stuff wasn't too bad. Uh, a lot of stuff got published. And 28 books later now, which I've written both fiction and nonfiction, um, it's brought me in terms of uh, branching out in other areas. I host a weekly radio show called um, Anything Abnormal or Paranormal, which used to be uh, Matters of the Mind. We changed our format this year, and I do that besides hosting our, our hit show, Niagara's Most Haunted. Wow, that's that's a lot. And addiction. <coughs> so, uh, addiction. So, what do you think the big addiction is right now? I guess cell phones. <laughs> You know what? Absolutely. In fact, uh, it's funny you bring that up because I, I, I say that it actually is texting. And in fact, I wrote a book on it called Technological Rage, which is actually free on my website at petersacco.com, uh, petersacco.com, which looks out why people are so addicted not only to cell phone texting, but also online social media, as well as even um, internet dating. And interestingly, when you know, you say, well, that's not a real, real addiction. Well, yeah, it is when it's interfering with people's lives. And you get as many people, um, when I was writing the book, doing the research with my peeps, uh, we were getting people saying, hey, I know my kid, my kid's friends are texting twenty to 30,000 text messages a month. So there's a concern there. But if you're looking in the, you know, the real serious stuff, the, uh, you know, it's pornography. There's no doubt about it. Pornography, especially Internet porn, is right off the map right now. Well, you think that's just because of the easy access? Absolutely. There is um, accessibility that you can now bring it anywhere you want with you. You have it on your phone, your iPad, your iPod, um, your BlackBerry, whatever you're using. So back in the day, you used to have to, you know, go watch it on a TV set. And now, um, you know, you had to be at a specific place at a TV set. Then you could bring it around on a laptop if you wanted to. But now it's actually got a pun intended right in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And, <laughs> It's causing people a lot of problems. It's wrecking a lot of marriages. It's destroying a lot of families. The ramifications from Internet pornography and pornography addictions is really bad. Wow. Oh, so, so do you think that it's something we're not evolving into or something that change isn't, it's not a good change then? Or I would like to say I don't think it is a good change because the bottom line is, is what's happening in a lot of situations um, – I wrote a book with Deb Lano. She's a sex therapist in the United States, Dr. Dr. Deb Lano. And we wrote a book called The Madonna Complex, which looks at why cheating is so high. 
and we found tremendously high correlations between pornography and cheating and also sexless marriages where guys just didn't want to have sex with their wives or their girlfriends because they're spending too much time doing you know the not so cool stuff self arousal and taking care of themselves that they're basically used up also some of them the wife or the girlfriend is the mother of their kid um, and if you look at this from a, a misogyny perspective or the Marianismo perspective which are the two dichotomies within the Madonna complex which I could spend hours and I actually do courses on this teaching uh, porn addictions and sex addictions you can see why the marriages have fallen apart because the, the, the actual sexual act with the spouse doesn't even come close to the fantasy that this guy's having with the, the porn actors and you know the actresses and all that kind of stuff hmm. so why do you think that is do you think that you just don't want to do it with the mother of your child then is that if you're taking the Mary Nesmo side of it the argument is is that once the person is the mother if you're looking at it that way there are some sexual acts sexual fantasies that you just don't do anymore because that is the mother of your kids and you're violating basically your child by doing that in a roundabout way where you're thinking okay I'm making my wife the mother of my kids dirty I'm violating that respect that we have and, you know and you know keep in mind it is it is the perspective of that person um, and in some cultures they view uh, belief systems that the wife i.e. their spouse is the mother of their kids and that's her sole purpose is to procreate therefore once the she's done her job that's what sex was for in the marriage then, you know, this person goes and cheats or uses pornography and says, okay, I'm going to go have the fun sex with somebody that I don't have to respect, per se. Right. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And if you're looking at it, you know, statistic-wise, there are now well over 100 million web pages online devoted to pornography. So when you see that, you know, it, it kind of tells you something's up. Yeah, that's strange. I, I mean, I, well, it's never been never been a thing for me. Um I, I like doing the real thing, but <laughs> <laughs> but so so doing this and being a psychology professor, professor and that, how did you get into most haunted, like Niagara's most haunted? Well, it, that's a really uh, a good question. Like what had happened, which was really neat, is um, about fourteen years ago, I did a gig. We did it with local TV here, and we put together what was called um, Haunted Niagara. And the show was so popular, it aired well over a hundred times. And it was the first documentary of its kind in Canada before you had ghost hunters, ghost investigators, and all these shows. So we were the first real deal that did this. And it just, throughout the years, people kept going, I really saw, I remember that show you guys did, would you ever do something like that again? And about three years ago, me and a good friend of mine, who is an actor, and he went to USC Film School, um, and he does his own stuff as well, too. We got this idea to start doing a web show on this. Well, as we're starting this up, all of a sudden, um, TV coach of Go Niagara says, hey, how would you like to do this with us? You know, we can use you can use all of our equipment. We can bring it right into HD, and we'll edit it and everything like that. So part of it was that. I thought there was a, you know, uh, a luster to that, but what was even better is I've always wanted to promote the region here in Niagara, which is one of the most beautiful places in the entire universe, that has the most historic places in North America, from the wars of 1812, a lot of buildings, forts, a lot of really cool artifacts. And I thought, people know all about the falls, people know all about the casinos, the Skyline Tower, the U.S. shopping at the malls there, the outlet malls, and now our mall here, Factory Outlet Mall. Let's bring them the history. Let's let kids know what the heritage of Canada is. And a lot of the heritage started right here because this is where the British basically kicked America's rear end out of our country and said, now we're going to colonize us and the rest is history. We're Canada. Yeah. It's also like a, the honeymoon capital of the world, right? So it's got to be. Yeah. Well, there's there's always something to do here. Um and there's a lot to see. But unfortunately, so many people get caught up in the tourism. And when I say tourism, I know I say it respectfully because, you know, I appreciate the tourism. It keeps our economy going. But a lot of the people don't leave the Clifton Hill, the casino area, or around the falls, the bridge. But yet, there are so many hamlets and jewels of history that are within this area that, you know, for crying out loud, the movie The Dead Zone starring Christopher Walken and Martin Sheen, based on Stephen King's book, is filmed five minutes from my house, 
back in the 80s in the Screaming Tunnel, which was, is one of the most historic tunnels in all of Canada that's haunted. Um, and people will oftentimes read about it from my web, the website NiagarsMostHaunted.com or hear me talk about it, and they're like, hey, I would rather go see that than go see the falls, which personally I wouldn't. But um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of cool things like that to see. Um, just a lot of scary urban legends and campfire ghost stories that have stood the test of time that are still around. And, uh, you know, people need to sign up for this stuff. Come see it. Yeah. Now, I see, uh, now I noticed that Niagara is most haunted. Now, you just started season three. It just came out, right? Yep. Yeah, we're now working on our second episode of season three, which is kind of interesting. We, as they're premiering, we're still working on them because of our the, the, the low budget that we have and also the hours that we're all limited with all of our careers, which we kind of do this on the side. And we had a premiere two weeks ago for Halloween, actually... No, last week, but, uh, or two weeks ago, the 24th we air, we premiered it, and then it premiered again last week, for, just in time for Halloween, and it was a 75-minute episode. Normally, we're 30-minute um, episodes, but we did a long one, which we're going to be submitting to film festivals. Um, people loved it. Uh, it was. I wrote it differently this year, um, where I took aspects of actual ghost investigation, combined them with our resident psychic, um, and then also our reenactments and then our traditional telling the stories of the historical places. And it was a great thing. We featured three um, haunted mansions that are now, um, one is a bed and breakfast, a very high-profile bed and breakfast. Another one is the John or the McFarland House, which is now a museum in Lower Niagara on the lake. And then Upper um, Niagara Parkway, which is Fort Erie, did Birdie Hall which was once a very elite house built by Captain John Forsythe, which was then used by dignitaries to stay there as a bed and breakfast. Hmm. So, so now, you actually have um, a resident psychic then, or a medium? Um, it's, it's kind of funny. They're not really residents. They're fluctuating because we've gone through three already this year. <laughs> it's not by choice. It's just, boy, they're dropping like flies with sicknesses. Um, but this one we now have, Susan Carter, we're hoping that she sticks around. So, yeah, we bring her on. Um, she is the real deal. Myself, I am a skeptic and cynic with a lot of stuff until I see some proof that the person can back up what they're talking about and show me something. And she nailed it with the bed and breakfast. Hmm. Okay. So, so where did, where did you get her from? Like, what was, a? Uh... Well, this is a funny story because... We just hosted a major Halloween party, which we do each year, to fundraise for a local charity. This year it was for kids with who are blind, deaf, and have autism. And the day we were supposed to um, go to the bed and breakfast, which is in another city close by, our resident psychic um, husband calls me and says, I'm sorry, but she can't come. She's really sick. She has the flu really bad. And we're thinking, oh, my God, we finally have the opportunity to go in there because we had already put this show together and that was one of the last things we needed to complete it. And I'm thinking all oh, this, it sucks. It's terrible. So I'm already not happy, but we had a meeting to go that morning. I had to go to for the fundraising Halloween party where I'm going to meet the folks that I'm working with on this, putting it together. And as it turns out, there's a nurse there and this nurse had volunteered her services that night of the Halloween party to do psychic readings. She then starts telling me we're talking, and she is a real, legit, real, a real, very good psychic. Um, so talk about serendipity, law of attraction. She literally fell into my lap, and when I say fall into my lap, she almost tripped on me and literally fell into my lap. She was walking <laughs> past me where I was sitting, so it all turned out good. Yeah, well, it's good. It, it's tough to find. There, there's there's um, something about it. You have to make sure that the person's real. You know, not not just there for the show. Well, absolutely. You know, while it's you, you get card readers, um, crystal readers, fortune tellers that you know they're very vague. With Susan, she was very specific, and before she even set foot into the house that we were filming at the bed and breakfast, she had already um, had some stuff she scribbled down on the way to the place. She had never been there. And she knew nothing about it, especially the history of the families that had lived there. And she did a walkthrough, 
said some stuff to me, and then we went and corrob- you know, talked about it, either corroborated or had it refuted by the owner of the house. And when she was telling the owner, the owner's jaw dropped and almost hit her marble counter that's in her beautiful kitchen. And she says, absolutely, Susan, how the hell could you have known that? Wow, that's that's great when that happens. Uh, you make a connection like that, and, and and it's good for everybody involved. Yeah, um, I was, you know, I, you wonder sometimes because we had one that came through a set, and it was just vague, vague. Like, oh, I think you know something bad happened in this room. Oh, somebody wasn't feeling good in this room. I think somebody was sick in this room. Okay, <laughs> well, the place used to be a hospital for crying out loud during the war. So what are the odds that somebody even had a, an upset stomach or hemorrhoids for crying out loud? I'm sure that made them qualify as not feeling well. Because if you had to, you know, you're not feeling great, you can't sit down, then you weren't feeling well. Yeah. No, it's it's really it's really a tough one. I, I, I've, uh, I'm actually the, the resident medium for the Canadian Paranormal Society. And so I go on two a year with them. And I know they're always bringing people in to, uh, you know, to kind of be trained or to see. And they always want to see. And there's a, just, yeah, there's a lot of that out there. I don't know. Um, people with just feelings. <laughs> so, so now, was, was there a place in your history that you found that was kind of the scariest for you or the one that kind of uh, put you off a little, like you, you, you were actually almost nervous about? Do you know what? It, yeah, there is a place, and it had absolutely nothing to do with ghosts, but rather the hike into the place. Um and what was really, it's actually DeQ Falls, which is in Thorold, Ontario, which is in between Niagara Falls and St. Catharines. DeQ Falls has the famous DeQ House. Still, well, that's where the house was, but it's only got the foundation because that is all that exists of this place from the War of 1812, and it was a mansion. And this is the, the place where Laura Secord had literally run through the forest and the Bruce Trail from Queenston, to um, this area to warn them that basically the Americans were coming and that they had basically trashed Niagara on the Lake. Well, in the in there is also um, the old hydro area, the reservoirs, and they um, used to have basically the electrical company to a degree. And prior to that, <clears throat> they had built these really this really cool mine shaft in there. And in this mine shaft, people have reported seeing apparitions, hearing screams, and definitely orbs, which is very common. So we decided, hey, let's go shoot this. First of all, there's three waterfalls there, which is absolutely stunning. Well, what you don't know about this is, first of all, you have to get down there in the first place. The hike is about an hour at best, if you're lucky. And you're literally going through wet areas that are slippery as hell along the little river, like the creek that's there, the, the rocks are moldy, <coughs> moss, wet. Um, there's a lot of mud. So you're slipping all over the place. You're, you've got a team of four of us there that are going to do this. We're carrying thousands of dollars worth of camera equipment, which is, you know, you're trying to protect us. And then once you get past the first falls, the, the two falls basically surround the uh, mine shaft that we've got to get to. Nobody told us that this was. You know, we have to scale the side of a hill, <clears throat> literally um, an embankment full of stone, which is literally a small mountain, on a rope, holding all this equipment, getting the heck around there. And at that point there, this was getting just ridiculously silly and dangerous. But, you know, you can see the falls as you're you know, up on the side of this mountain. You're thinking, oh, my gosh, I cannot turn back. No, this is just too cool. <laughs> so that was my scariest thing, Al, because, you know, I couldn't walk for two weeks after this event i literally (laughs) hurt my back one of our team guys uh he went down a hill like just a bouncing medicine ball and you know flipped went down there thank god he didn't break anything with that said if any of us would have got scorched or hurt there we would have to been airlifted out because that's the only way to get out of this it's it literally is um a valley that's below this mountainous area which is the escarpment and you're not getting out because of all the trees in that yeah well, so so then, have you seen uh, anything personally that has sort of? Because uh, you say you're a skeptic, so you're so that means you're 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 critical about what you're about the other side. Let's say. So, is there anything that you've seen or witnessed that sort of made you a little more open to it? Um. Oh, absolutely. We were filming at um. 
a place called the Lighthouse Pub. It's now a derelict building which is for sale, and it's on the Upper Niagara Parkway. I knew the owner, Kevin Smith, he used to own it, and he used to own what was called the Fudge Factory, the Great Canadian Fudge Factory, I don't know where they made Canadian fudge. Um, I know back in the day they used to do psychic readings up there, and in fact there was a production crew that shot something, uh, a Canadian production crew, and they actually did a seance in there, which probably wasn't a very cool idea because it went amok. It turned out very bad, that much I know. With that said, this place has now sat there. It's just, it needs a lot of work. The building's got to be a bullet at least 220 years old. It's gorgeous, though. So we were there that night, and we were just doing some shoots outside, not inside. And it was at about 9.15. We had the psychic that we were with last year, Stan Mello, who's a very good psychic, uh, tremendous. He's transplanted from New York City. Um, Stan is, uh, I want to say, early 60s. I hope I'm right. He's going to kill me if ever hears this. And like, what the hell, Pete? <laughs> Only like 45. So <laughs> this guy had died, um, died of a massive coronary uh, in the basically the ER. And they brought him back to life. And ever since Stan was brought back to life, he's telling me the story. He could see stuff. And so we brought him, his partner, and they had their equipment. They do investigations as well. Besides him doing psychic investigation, he actually does the real paranormal investigations with their stuff. Well, they started snapping off pictures, which is really cool. The front of the building has these huge, giant windows. And, you know, he's taking pictures. First of all, they're not done with flashes. The sun is setting behind the building, so there's no reflections of anything in the front there. So, you know, don't think anything of it. You just think, oh, okay, fun, everybody done, let's get the hell out of here because the mosquitoes are biting, because we're literally right around the Niagara River. So later that night, I get an email from him, oh, it's going close close to 11 o'clock, and he goes, Pete, 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 Pete. No, first he calls me, he goes, check your email. I just sent you something, it's going to be so cool, you're going to be blown away. I go open this up, and sure enough, in one of the areas he's taking pictures, the biggest window, full-blown face of a phantom. That's what we called it, because there's no other explanation for it. And it does look like the most disgusting face I've ever seen. And it is pretty big. It looks like the uh, character Jigsaw in the you know the movie Saw. Exactly. Oh. Um, we've shown this around, and there's no doubt about it. This is not a reflection of any sorts. Or, you know, you look at the clouds and you see a face. This is the real deal. That made me a big-time believer there. Has there been any places that you want to go that you haven't been able to yet? Uh any, any desire to go some someplace that's haunted? Yes, ironically, there's been three. <laughs> and, and after the interviews uh, today, um, I'll, I'll probably be on the phone actually talking to a mayor about getting us in the one that we now have a new mayor elect that just got elected. And this person seems to be a pretty decent, really good person. And I worked to him at a fundraising activity last week for the Halloween party. Definitely this one place. It's a 180-year-old giant mansion that is now a school that I'd love to get into. But with that said, there was a couple places I really, really wanted to get into. We had permission from the highest up, and he then said, well, you've got to talk to my manager. You've got to clear it with them because I can't, you know, step over this guy's head. He's going to be upset, and I don't want to wreck protocol. And he goes, I'm sure everything will be fine. So, you know, we're thinking, okay, we got a slam dunk here. Everything's going to be sweeter than apple pie here. So we, you know, I call. We start to plan this. And then as we're planning this, you know, I'm talking to the guy, and then he just instantly says, sorry, you guys can't do this. Um, because basically you're going to be talking about ghosts, and that's ethnically and culturally insensitive because not everybody believes in them, and you're going to be offending a lot of people. And you might scare people as well, too. So, you know, it was a public place. We understood it. But because of certain religiosities, he just thought it was not okay to be doing this there, even though everybody else was okay with it. So, you know, we understood that, even though we really wanted to, you know, we had our eyes and our hearts set in the place, something better came along. And the same with another place, too. They, you know, other places had filmed there, but then they got new ownership. We really wanted to be part of it. But at this point here, they said, no, we don't want to scare people away. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes that's something you have to deal with. So wh where where do you see yourself going now? Um, actually, what we're looking at doing is we're we're going to be out in the Fort Erie area doing some stuff at a haunted restaurant, which was an old bank. 
and there's three really cool ghost stories that go in there, and people from all walks of life have seen the ghost. There's a ghost of a black American kid, which one psychic said. That kid was from the late 1700s, early 1800s, that came across the states from down south when the slaves were getting the hell out of Dodge. Um, they would come north of the border, and they'd come across the Niagara River, and underneath the Birdie Hall is a tunnel that would the slaves would then come into the basement of Birdie Hall, which is a giant old mansion I was talking about, and stay there, seek haven there for a bit before they went north. Um, supposedly, this kid died in there, and the bank bistro, which is literally a block away, the kid is seen in this place. Um, they also see an older man that, ironically, somebody was choking to death in there, where they had to perform the Heimlich on this person. As And while, I guess, the guy was choking or whatever, um, he saw this old man standing over him, trying to revive him, too. And then I guess when the guy came to, the fellow that was choking, he says, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, but there was no old man standing there. And he asked, where was the old man that was working on me? And they all looked at him. He said, there was no old man here. And yet this old man is seen by many, many, many over the years sitting at a bar. He comes and he goes, and he just sits at the end of the bar. And then there's a guy from the 1950s, kind of dressed as a... You know, with the ducktail hair, greased hair, and all that stuff that sits there, and people have noticed him too. So we want to go in there, uh, bring our team in, bring the psychic in, and then do reenactments as well as get the story and see what we come up with. Hmm. So you see doing this for uh, more years to come then, eh? Do you know what, Al? It would be really great to do it. Yeah, to keep going with it. I think we're going to start streaming it online. We're going to bring smaller webisodes so that people around the world can see it because people want to find us. They find us all the time at Comic-Cons. Talks I do, um, people from other parts of the world, India, Australia, Japan, Europe, they see the show while they're down here visiting in the summer. They see it in their hotel rooms. Then they go home and it's like, hey, where can we get a copy? Or we can, where we, we find this in our country? <laughs> and, you know, you can't. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're at the point now where we're trying to bring it bigger and better. Uh, but also more consistently to people, um, probably the web, because everybody to this degree has, you know, a, an Internet that they can get access to this. Yeah, that seems to be the big thing. That's the, the good advantage to it, for sure. So now about yourself, um, what, what kind of things do you watch? Like, what are your influences? Hmm, my influences. Right now, I could say I'm currently watching Amazing Race and Survivor, which would both, you know, be in a, a testimony for going and filming in that bloody DQ falls there in the mine shaft. Because yeah. that's what, literally what it felt like, Survivor meets Amazing Race. Um, but I really do love um, The Walking Dead. I'm a big Walking Dead guy. love watching it. I um, think it's really cool. Um, I like watching, funny of all things, The Vampire Diaries. I was at Comic-Con in Toronto Oh, for Labor Day weekend, and I wound up um, spending a little bit of time chatting with uh, Ian Sumner Holder. We were in the VIP lounge there getting a lunch in that, and I started chatting with him, as well as David Morrissey, who plays the governor on The Walking Dead, which kind of inspired me to do a short little book, because uh, I talked to a lot of people over that weekend that came to our booth. There was about 120,000 people there. And with that said, there, there's a free ebook on my website at petersacco.com called Why in the Hell vampire or why in the hell serial killers crazy for vampires and zombies well, you know basically look at why people are so obsessed with them so i just did that um because i do like those shows the zombie shows the vampire shows and i watch american horror story which is a really cool story uh show love jessica lang this is their fourth season and really outside of that i can't really say i'm watching too much more. <laughs> I'm trying to think of which more I do watch, and really, there's nothing more than that I really do watch. I do. I just like movies and like to read. Yeah. So The Walking Dead. So what do you think the deal is with uh, all the zombies and stuff? Like, uh, it's a big fascination right now. You know what? <laughs> I I I was talking about this uh, about this with some folks and that stuff, and I think for some it, it it's kind of like an escape where, you know, you can't beat up real people in everyday life, so let's go watch people kick the crap out of zombies and kill them. And, you know, and some people think that's their catharsis. 
where others look at this and, you know, this is the life after, so to speak. Same thing with vampires. This is the, you know, giving you an idea that, you know, that there's more to life after this is all said and done with. So I get that. Um, you know, it, it really is interesting, like, where this is all coming from. And, I, you know, as soon as Ebola came out, I thought, oh, here, we're going to go with this. This is zombie apocalypse coming. And sure enough, you get these fanatics that cult leaders, cult wannabes uh, leaders that uh, jump on the bandwagon and then they're running from the rooftop screaming, yeah, see, here it is, I told you, this is the end times. So if SARS didn't do us in, West Nile virus didn't do it in, do us in, H1N1 didn't do us in, Y2K didn't do us in, smallpox, chickenpox, rubella, you name it, hasn't done us in, well, maybe this is the one. And unfortunately, I, I hate to say this all, but people like to just take this stuff, especially the fanatics, and try to scare people to get them under their thumb. Yeah, I, I well, yeah, the I, the whole American media has gone. It's about scaring, you know. It seems to be a, a fear thing on news. So you know, the Ebola I think fits perfect with like Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah, like it really is, and it's funny because I've asked. You know, jokingly, in jest, I've asked uh, at other Comic Cons some of the, the, the folks from The Walking Dead, the actors that are currently on there or past, did they ever tell you where the hell this thing came from or what the hell's going on? And it's like, nope. And they really had, they were not told. They don't know where it came from or what the outcome is going to be, per se, which is kind of cool. You know, to be part of a series where you, the hell, you know, you have no idea what the hell's going on. And you actually are reprising the role each week or whenever you're doing their filming and kind of going with the flow, much like us watching it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm surprised about how, biz, how popular it is, that's all. But I guess it kind of goes with what's going on in the world, so it kind of fits. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, like right now, you're looking, you know, you look at these shows here. Um, as I say, I think it's, a, it, it's the creativity. I think... It's horror, but yet it's not over-the-top horror. And it's kind of funny because somebody had, you know, if I was asked to make a comparison, back in the day, you know, we went through these really flippant, um, how should we say, diversions. It was the monster movies like Dracula, Frankenstein, the werewolf, the mummy, the creature from the Black Lagoon. You had that type of monster. Then you went the flip side where you had the slasher, Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers, Leatherface. <laughs> so you had the ones that were just homicidal serial killers that wielded knives, axes, machetes. And then you had people that ate that stuff up. Well, if you look at the zombie stuff, and this is, you know, in between there, you had the George Romero stuff, Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, all that stuff. He was kind of the in-between stuff. So if you now look, I believe, and this is my opinion, you look at The Walking Dead, this brings the best of both worlds and combines them where you get the old-school monster movies combined with the slasher flicks, and this is where you get, basically, the um, today's horror movies, uh, World War Z, uh, that just came out this year. Um, yeah, it was this year. Yeah. You see these types of movies, or no, last year it was. Don't you, blur. You, yeah, you see those types of movies, and then you go, okay, now I, I, I can see where it's going, but instead, the humans are the slashers. They get to be the ones, you know, the protagonists with the weapons. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I mean, I grew up in the uh, well with the dark shadows and oh, uh, Barnabas. Yeah, and into into the Night Stalker and stuff. The sixties and seventies. Yeah, so that was kind of like my growing up time, and that sort of that that was as scary as it got then. <laughs> oh, I have to say, I love Kolchak. I have the episodes. I bought the collection, and I'll never. The, 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 my favorite was always the Jack the Ripper episode. That one, and obviously the vampire. Yeah. They were two of the best. Um, and then, you see, from that point out, I fell into the same trap as Chris Carter did, the creator of the X-Files. And Chris, I guess, liked the Kolchak series so much, it inspired him to actually create the X-Files, which I am a huge X-Files junkie to this day, and I still can't wait till the third movie comes out, which I guess it's possibly in the works now. Yeah, that's what I've, I've heard that, yeah. It's funny, the Jack the Ripper. I just, I, I just interviewed uh, Russell Edwards, who wrote that naming Jack the Ripper, who was the one that discovered the shawl. Yes. You know that was that's a real interesting. Uh, it's kind of the best uh, theory so far, best DNA evidence anyway. Yeah, I wrote a, a short story on it. Um, actually, I teach a course, criminal psychology, psychopathic minds, and I cover Jack the Ripper in there. 
because it's one of the most intriguing cases ever. Because if it happened today, he would be caught so fast to actually blow your, you know, the doors off you because of DNA testing, eyewitnesses accounts, and all that kind of stuff. This guy would not have gotten away with what he did um, in such a, you know, a, a period of time that he did. But what is so intriguing, and till, still to this very day, I've always loved the royal conspiracy theory. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, that it was, you know, the doc was doing it on the behalf of the queen to basically prevent this from getting out and possibly uh, a bastard child taking over the throne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, n- none of it surprises you. You know, it's like, you know, actually, I, I listened to uh, one of your radio shows, um, the one on zombies. <laughs> oh, oh, we had Alex Rakovich yeah. on her, I believe. They're yeah. Like, they're yeah. like the Legion. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I, I loved that how uh, the the mo- the safest cities, like you had St. John's and Edmonton and Regina, and, that. <laughs> and that's in Canada. Yeah, in Canada. Yeah, that was because, pretty- in my humble opinion, I've always said this, and I've always thought, okay, and you know, it's just a show, and this is you know, be me being a psychologist, me having worked with cops for a long time. The bottom line is, if I was down there in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, during this zombie apocalypse, which obviously they're doing this, they're filming down Peachtree area, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you, let's let's use the math here, okay? From that area down to the Panhandle of Florida, it isn't too long to get to. Or better still, I can just cut right across the Atlantic. Let's put it this way: there's got to be a ton of boats there that are not being used. Hop on a bloody boat, get a couple of them, tie them together, load them up with supplies, and then go out past the Keys. And there's a ton of islands out there all around the Bahamas, Cuba. And guess what? These things can't swim. Whatever gets out there is going to be torn torn apart by sharks or whatever the heck's out there. And you can actually survive all year round out there. Um, and there's going to be vegetation in some of these things. There's going to be self-promoting, you know, vegetables, fruits. You can bring your own seeds. Start it out there, and whatever zombies are on the island, you clean them out first. Whereas Canada's got to be one of the worst places because you go up north, we get winter, we're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so we were talking about that. Going back to that show, Al, I remember uh, when Alex had brought that up, we talked off off um, off air, and I just thought, man, if they have a real thing like that, I'm down south, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna hide in a Sam's Club or a Costco, right? That's... Another great place. Just think about it. You could just kind of great fortress, by the way. Those things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess they would be. Okay. So now, just just going uh, further. So I was just gonna say, um, do you want to give out any information for people to get a hold of you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, uh, I, I go by two distinct websites. First of all, we have the official TV show website, niagarasmosthaunted.com. You can find us there. I believe you can find that on Twitter, too. I'm not technologically savvy. Um, that's handled by our team. And then there's my website, petersacco.com, petersacco.com. And there you can keep up to um, what I'm doing. Uh, in terms of writing and in terms of new projects, there's a couple new films I hooked up with um, as executive or co-producers on. And then also, right now, if you go to my website, petersacco.com, I have three free ebooks. And in fact, two of them are going to be really popular again. Uh, well over millions have read the one on technological rage, which looks at the addictions to, as we talked about at the beginning of your show here, um, the segment on Internet um, texting addictions, online dating addictions. Then I also have one why people are addicted to procrastination, on why it is so bloody hard to keep your resolutions. And resolutions are literally about eight weeks away or less where people start making these and then they're going to be flat on their faces within two weeks <laughs> after January 1st going, what went wrong? And then, as I said, I've got the other ebook, which definitely is getting a lot of reads, which for anybody in the vampires or Zombies would love it. Uh, why in the hell serial killers crazy for vampires and zombies? Wow, interesting. Well, it's certainly been a pleasure. I, I'm glad you were able to join uh, join me today, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Anytime, Al. It'd be a pleasure to be back on your show. You got a great show, you got a great listenership, and it would be my honor to come back on and talk to all your great folks. Well, great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. 
To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.